Okay, thank, thanks, Charlie. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Great to see everyone in person again. It's kind of unusual not to just see a screen around everyone's face, but uh, I realize people are actually different heights and <laughs> different things like that. But uh, yeah, so, so we're going to talk through the tutorial this morning on, on hydrogen and um, really, as Charlie said, focus on the kind of systems integration related aspects of hydrogen, not necessarily talk about the technology, but from the perspective of how we're going to think about that in these kind of forums in the future. So trying to set up some of that as we, as we kind of start meet, seeing hydrogen become a bigger and bigger issue um, in the system. So um, William and myself, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the overall uh, uh, panel or the tutorial and, um, and talk about a paper that was recently released, I think in January, um, by ESIG on this topic. Um, and then William is going to spend the bulk of this first session uh, talking through some of the topics related to, to hydrogen and, um, and electrification, um, some of the kind of key technology aspects, some of the key system integration topics, the costs, other things like that. So, it is to kind of give people a, a good understanding and grounding in some of this topic. I'm sure many of you have seen some of these issues, particularly as Charlie said, the last year we're, we're seeing these news articles every week about some new pilot project or some new particular funding agency that's gone after some topic. Um, but if you have questions on that, then we'll have a Q&A after William's talk uh, to kind of clarify on some of those things. And then we have three folks um, joining us virtually for a panel discussion. Uh, Brittany from EPRI, who's involved in our Low Carbon Resource Initiative. Uh, Pierre Luigi from the University of Melbourne to talk about some of the kind of electrical engineering work he's been doing related to, to hydrogen. And then Elizabeth from Shell will, will talk about some of the demonstration projects and pilot projects that, that they've got going on. And hopefully we have time for a good discussion at the end. So do be thinking of questions to ask and, and comments to make as, um, as we're trying to look through, or as, we're, as we're going through the, the material here. Um, so before I get into some of the, the background, and, and I'm gonna give a very high level view here for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, We'll just quickly talk about the report. So this was released in, uh, as I said, in January. There's a link on the slides once you get it. Um, myself and Niall McDowell from Imperial College London were the leads on the, um, on the report um, and had a lot of input from folks, particularly William and, and a few others here on the, uh, on the panel today um, on kind of the, the, the information that they're seeing, the, the recent experience they've had, the topics they thought should be, should be raised. So, um, that was released. Definitely encourage if you're interested in this topic to go out and um, and download that after the, the meeting if you haven't already. Um, actually, just real quick, show of hands. Has, have people actually seen this report? Who's who's read it, scanned it? Okay, so so some folks will already be kind of familiar with this. Um, the the report was really around kind of in the context of clean energy, particularly renewable energy, given the the ESIG focus um, in in most of the ESIG meetings around renewables. Um, as we see these large deployments of renewable energy, whether in our context, we were thinking, you're thinking up around 70% plus, the actual number maybe doesn't matter specifically, but very high amounts of annual share of renewables. That's when we see a lot of the kind of decarbonization pathway studies showing us that things like hydrogen and increased industrial electrification are really gonna be needed to help provide that last little bit of flexibility we need to the system. Um, so really looking at um, the fact that we're gonna be retiring a lot of the existing thermal plant and, and then trying to figure out where we're gonna get that flexibility. At least some of that might come from some of these sources. Obviously there's other things like batteries, other types of demand response that'll be important, um, but trying to look through when these types of resources might be useful. So thinking about things like oversupply conditions, we put a lot of wind and solar in, there's gonna be time periods when you have too much of it, uh, you know, spring, that type of thing. And, moving that energy around uh, um, so you can use it later in the year. Um, as well as then the fact that at other periods, you're gonna have these la large deficits. You get a few weeks without wind and solar and um, having some other resource might be very valuable. So even though it might make up a relatively small share of the overall energy mix, it can be very important for capacity and flexibility and other services. I'm really trying to look at it from the power system perspective um, and, um, and how we might plan and operate with, with some of the conclusions we'll talk about. I'm not gonna get into some of these slides in detail. They'll be there after the, the meeting. Um, and William's gonna to touch on a lot of them more. One thing I will mention because the focus on the rest of today is gonna to be on hydrogen. Just the other part of that paper was around industrial electrification. Um, so just to be aware that that's obviously a huge potential resource as well and can sometimes overlap with hydrogen where you, you 
will electrify it by, by using hydrogen. Um, but there's a lot of these energy intensive industries. The graph on the right is kind of hard to read there, but um, the, the red dot is the, the share of, of electricity in, the, in their overall energy consumption. And you can see that some, some industries already have a pretty high share, over 60% of their energy is coming from electricity as, as opposed to other types of energy. Um, but there's some that are very low still and there are potentially ways we can increase that. So um, it gets into things like um, process electrification. So in, in terms of um, using secondary steel and electric arc furnaces, that's an area where you could potentially see more electrification. Um, but there's others that might require greater technology development. So anything that requires heating over a thousand degrees Celsius um, probably isn't something that can be easily ele electrified right now, uh, but could be in the future with some of the kind of technologies that people are investigating. Um, but if you do get that electrification, and, and we do see um, some of these, in, there's no doubt that they're going to be increasingly electrified. It's just a question of how much they will be. Um, they'll be able to provide some flexibility. You can see kind of smelters providing flexibility, shifting demand around grid services. A lot of these can respond quickly and provide some of the grid services that will be, um, will be needed once we start retiring other generation on the system. Um, and it also just means greater electricity build out is needed, electricity capacity is needed. Um, some of the studies in the EU showed a, a four time mm -hmm. increase in, um, in capacity coming or in electricity demand due to the fact you might in, in electrify industry. Uh, and then there's obviously a lot of barriers there around things like um, costs. Some of them are policy related barriers. Um, if they are gonna be providing this type of flexibility, most of these are right now kind of base load, load. They're the same load all the time. And so being able to shift that around is gonna become challenging as well. So. I've been thinking about that and thinking about competitive advantages as well or disadvantages. Uh, this is one of those things where if, if it's happening in one country and not in another, then you get most of that manufacturing moving to that other country and doesn't really make a big dent in the overall decarbonization goals. So the goal should really be to try and understand um, how we can do this in a kind of systematic way. When it comes to hydrogen, William's gonna get into this in a lot more detail, don't, so I don't wanna steal his thunder. Um, but um, the report does look at things like uh, questions around how will we actually see hydrogen? I think for some of us a few years ago when we heard hydrogen, we were thinking this kind of round trip, you create hydrogen, you store it, and then you create electricity. And while that's certainly a potential role in the future, there's far more immediate things that could be done that, um, that could provide a lot more flexibility, that the costs aren't as prohibitive, that the technology is there. Um, but also then looking at what technology development might be required, what are the cost aspects of this? And, and how does it fit into operations of planning in general? Um, we do see that kind of use as a flexible load in the next few years will be important. And um, the, uh, the demand side role, will, at least the next 10 to 20 years will be, will be kind of where we mostly see hydrogen. There are gonna be some roles though for, um, for kind of power to gas and, and other aspects as well. Um, it, it is one means to produce hydrogen. Um, is kind of the part to gas aspect. We, we looked into that and, and saw quite a few examples, mostly still as kind of demonstration projects um, that are going on. Uh, but the idea of um, you could create hydrogen, you could use that in other industrial processes. You could also use it through methanization, bring it into the gas system and bring it back into gas turbines or, or fuel cells or use it to replace natural gas and heating or other applications. Um, when, when people have looked at this from a decarbonization perspective, Typically, you've kind of seen this um, very small amount of the total energy, typically on those bars that show different colors for different energy sources. Hydrogen's a small little sliver at the very top. But, but it is important to note that's energy. When that's used could be quite important still because it could be a good capacity resource or, or energy resource from an energy adequacy perspective. We, we know that not all ours are, are equally um, challenging and hydrogen could be there when, for those more challenging periods. Uh, but then there is those cost aspects around the, the kind of two-way coupling as well. So and I think William's going to touch on that a lot more. Um, flexibility, as I said, we'll, we'll think about it from the demand side at the start at least, and as it feeds stock to other industries. Um, we may see some of this kind of developing up in pockets where specific regions start seeing production of hydrogen. Um, if there is hydrogen storage, hydrogen networks around to, uh, to offtake that. Um, and one of the, the things I really came across from looking at the literature and, and talking with some of the folks in the working group is this kind of idea of um, producing the fuels away from where they're needed and, and potentially transporting them can be a, a very beneficial way to do this. Um, you've got places like the Middle East or Australia, parts of this, not far from where we are now, that have great solar resources, for example, and then being able to produce there and ship to where the, the demand is. You, you see a lot of that discussion in Europe as well. Um, you know, 
being able to think about how to, to leverage some of the gas transmission could be very important there. Uh, we have very little amount of hydrogen pipeline, and this is just in miles. It doesn't show the, the kind of size of the pipe, but 1,600 miles of hydrogen compared to 320,000 miles of gas transmission by one <coughs> number that, uh, that was shared. Um, so can we leverage some of the, the gas network as well? And of course, with all of this, we're going to impact on the markets. Uh, it ch changes the price. I will even touch on this as well a little bit more in his presentation. Um, another thing we want to do, and um, we will continue to do in the kind of ongoing work in this, is around the characteristics of hydrogen as, um, as its ability to provide grid services. So trying to think through things like um, what operating range does it have, essentially? Can you, can you have flexibility across the entire range? Can it be at a different load level, or does it have to be on or off? Or, and that varies depending on the technologies. There's the three main technologies here that we looked at and, and tried to summarize. Um, you could have, um, for some of this, to provide some of the flexibility, you'll still have to have some type of hydrogen storage or some network there, as well as potentially electricity storage on, on the other side. Um, and uh, we'll, we will start seeing some of these technologies being able to be reversible easier than others. Um, and of course, you could also fit out gas turbines as well. So. And that was really just a very quick overview because William's going to get into it a lot more. But when we looked at all this, we tried to figure out what are the kind of system operations and planning needs from a, a power system side. One is obviously the planning processes, better integrating some of these resources into transmission planning and to resource planning able to develop models for those as needed, develop standards to be able to integrate those more, more appropriately. And that could be, you know, PSC, PSLF type modeling, where you're trying to build an actual generic model of what an electrolyzer looks like or understand what's going to be needed in the, in the future interconnection study for electrolyzers. It, it could also be looking at resource planning models and trying to understand how to model shifting of energy in, a, in an IRP type process. Um, in the operational side, as they start getting deployed, we'll have to think through how are they being used to provide flexibility? Does that change how we think about flexibility products or um, some of the, the ways we incentivize flexibility now? Uh, will we be able to get that same flexibility from these types of resources than we are from, from thermal plant, for example, um, or for batteries? And uh, looking at you know, how we develop, it could be, do we, how, how do, is there a market model needed for some of these types of functions? Or do we, can we develop some generic market model that can be then you can plug in some of the electrolyzers and other things that could be potentially big source of flexibility. Um, and then obviously the technology side of things, I think it's important as from the power system side that we let the folks doing the demonstrations and the technology development know what type of performance is needed. What, what are the things that are actually going to be most valuable in the future? Um, it, obviously costs are gonna be hugely important, but if that costs mean that they can't do some particular service that could be very valuable, you wanna be able to point that out as well. So able to kind of have that dialogue between the power system folks that are going to be using some of these as flexibility resources and the um and the folks developing some of these projects will be important um, and part of that is pilots and demonstrations we need to, to demonstrate some of these things we need to understand how they'll uh, they'll provide some of the services going forward um just where we're going with this um here at ESIG, we'll be talking on thursday at the uh working group meeting for system operations and market design we'll kind of be kicking off phase two of this, um, or discussing what we're doing in phase two. I really want to get into a little bit more detail on some of the specifics around how you might plan for some of these, um, these resources. So what we already know, what we can model right now versus what's a gap in the modeling uh, framework in terms of things like transmission modeling, um, you know, resource planning, operational models, and market models. So what's, what additional things do we need to know from the technologies and what does the technologies need to know from the system side of things and really kind of getting into some of the detail there. The aim is not to do a, a detailed large scale simulation study across a, an ISO footprint or anything like that, but maybe taking some um, kind of toy models and trying to demonstrate some of these issues about how you might be able to provide uh, flexibility from these resources. Um, so that, that's kind of what we're looking to do over the next around six months or so. So if you're interested in that and attending the working group meeting, do let me know. Or if you're, if you're not able to come on Thursday, just uh, reach out to me at the break here or, or after the session. So with that, um, I do want to hand it off to William um, so that he can kind of cover this in, in a lot more detail than I just did. And then we'll have some Q&A uh, at the end. So I'll, I'll be happy to take questions then if there's any for me as well.
Okay. Um, good morning. Well, that's the advantage of wearing a tie that you can put this mic on your tie. Um, I was a bit embarrassed at the beginning because it looked like I was the only one with a tie. Uh, but now I saw that there's uh, one other gentleman here with a tie, so welcome and you should be congratulated because this is a celebration, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm a bit ashamed. I, I just don't see why the management doesn't wear a tie. This is after two years and a half that we're here together in person. It's great. So I'm actually, it's with pleasure that I'm wearing my tie. Now, uh, come on, don't give excuses. Don't give excuses. Sir. Okay, well, anyway. Sorry? Oh, okay. Some people didn't hear my joke, so... <laughs> <laughs> Oops, what happens here? It just switched at the top of the room. Where? Uh, at the top of the room. It should be uh, turned off on the screen. Oh, okay. Well, that was only for the people who are here, here in person, so that's... Uh, <laughs> Where's at the top? This thing? Yeah. Yes. All right. So let me repeat. No, I won't repeat. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see what we can do. Um, I just wrote a few things down here. First of all, um, this is going to be a presentation with a somewhat European flavor. First of all, I'm from Europe, and in Europe, the hydrogen thing is really a big thing. There are lots of discussions, many initiatives, but lots of discussions, disagreements, and all these types together. So for the folks from this country, I would say, listen, uh, try to inform yourself, and then judge. Don't copy the bad things that we're doing and try to do only the good things. Okay, that's, I think, a very important thing. Um, perhaps most of the people here in the room are uh, electrical power engineers. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit more on the mechanical side, although my first degrees are all, well, basically all my degrees are, uh, are power engineering degrees. I ended up in the mechanical engineering department for, whatever, for certain reasons. So uh, hydrogen has been on my plate for about 10 years or something like that. And when people are too enthusiastic about certain things, then I'm becoming a little bit skeptical, okay? So I'm a healthy skeptic, let me put it that way, and the numbers have to prove their way. Um, there are many reports, publications, and all the discussions that are going on, uh, but a lot of people are just turning it uh, their own way. Um, and it is indeed not, let me say it a little bit politely, not all reports and documents that you read and speeches are tr trustworthy, okay? First of all, they almost never say exactly what system that they're discussing. What are the constraints that they take into account? And what are the hypotheses? So if you start reading a report, and actually that's not only for hydrogen, but if you start reading a report, there are no hypotheses of these things, just dump it. Because for hydrogen, it's actually very, very important. It looks nice but there are some ifs and buts. I should say that um, this here, uh, what, we, what I wrote, what, uh, what, what also then uh, these the slides um, and, and my ideas, they were mostly, and most of the studies, mostly dating from before February 24th. Now for Europe, that's quite an important thing uh, because uh, Vladimir's actions on the 24th of February will have a massive impact on Europe. So try to keep that in mind. I will mention it whenever it's necessary. Uh, in Europe, it is actually driven, especially by two countries, uh, Germany and the Netherlands, for two particular reasons. Germany is because they don't basically allow anything else than just renewables, because they're going to phase out uh, their coal-fired plants by, originally it was 2038. Now the new government is saying 2030. They were going to put everything on gas. Now with Vladimir's actions, forget it. So it's gonna be much, much more difficult. The Netherlands, because they are going to move away from their, uh, their natural gas in, in Groningen because of earthquakes. And who is leading the European Commission now? Ursula von, uh, um, uh, von der Leyen, that sounds German, isn't it? And Franz Timmermans, that sounds Dutch. So you know basically where this goes and how uh, the policy is basically driving these things. Okay, so uh, that I think will do as an introduction. Uh, let me then just uh, see. Well, there's a nice thing that I stole from, um, uh, from um, Mr. Liebreich. Um, so um, Michael Liebreich, who also got it from somebody else. Is this a tool for all means? 
And uh, it's a big, big, big question mark. Actually, I could already say, no, 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 don't believe it. It's much better to take this thing here. That's uh, nicer. Uh, it only has a few useful things, but you don't need all that stuff that is uh, on there. Uh, I will come to this and uh, Michael Liebreich from uh, Bloomberg, he made an interesting thing. He calls it the hydrogen ladder. Um, where he then basically says the A there, that is where hydrogen will be very likely unavoidable, and G is where it will be very likely uncompetitive. Now he updates that on a regular basis. His latest thing, thinking is about this thing, and that's especially because of competing technologies. And of course, as you all well know, and most of you are power engineers, um, what is very, very important is that, uh, for instance, that the batteries uh, because the cost has come down uh, dramatically of the batteries, uh, they give a hard time basically to hydrogen, let me put it that way. Um, this is, uh, there is a publication and I can give you the, the reference if, if you wish to do that, okay? All right, now first I'll give you some preliminaries. I don't want to insult anybody, but I'll try to just uh, take you by the hand if you um, are not all that well informed. Uh, just the color discussion, it's not uniform everywhere, but just to keep it in mind. Uh, so what is black, that is just if it comes from coal. Blue, uh, sorry, gray, that comes from natural gas without doing anything else. Brown would be then lignite. Okay, blue would be with natural gas, but with carbon capture and storage. So you take the CO2 emissions out of there. And green, that is then coming from renewable electricity, well, basically mainly uh, the uh, PV and, and wind. Um, uh, recently, there is an interesting uh, development that is called then turquoise, because you might always say with the blue one, okay, carbon capture and storage, where are you going to store your CO2? Well, turquoise is something where you do it via a process which is called pyrolysis, and there the product, as a matter of fact, is uh, solid carbon. But it's much easier to just bury solid carbon and just get rid of that. You even might market it, and uh, that might indeed then solve that thing. Now, the German uh, big um, uh, chemical companies are working on that very, very hard. And the nuclear electrolysis, uh, well, nuclear electricity and then electrolysis and these things, and they may be at higher temperatures. Now, people, some people call it then pink, which is then uh, especially uh, an interest of France. Now, since there is no agreement on these things that many people recommend just and, and say, well, forget about the colors, just look at what is the CO2 content, because in the end, that's the overall goal, and it will be different in different countries anyway. So if, if we can talk about decarbon decarbonized hydrogen, that's the way to go. This, for instance, is uh, um, something that uh, is published, uh, is the World Energy Council of, of Europe that published this thing they give here also a particular uh, list. And you see that for nuclear, you have even different colors that people then come up with, but anyway. Okay, now when you're talking about hydrogen, make sure that you don't get fooled. Uh, there's a big difference if you look at the characteristics per unit mass or per unit volume. Okay, and so you have to keep that in mind always. And when you talk about per unit volume, then you have to make sure that you do it at standard conditions, because usually they uh, are operated at different pressures. Okay, now this is the table that I'll just give you here on the right hand side, you see, um, uh, for comparison, um, the uh, energy per unit mass is three times that of gasoline, or uh, yeah, that's what you call it here, right? Ga well, yeah, that always bothers me in this country, I'm sorry to say, if you talk about gas, especially in this context, what do you talk about? Huh? In that sense, the British are easier to talk about petrol. Uh, so, but anyway, here we're talking about gasoline. Uh, the energy density um, at ambient conditions that are one third of natural gas and the uh, specific energy uh, liquefied that would be one third of LNG. Uh, but the uh, important thing is that, uh, and that's what I always do because and that's very confusing because in the hydrogen literature, they always like to talk in kilograms. Now, let's be honest, nobody really understands or knows what these kilograms mean, okay? So it's much better to just convert it to, let's say, to energy things. And uh, if you then are going to go back to electricity or something, let's just use megawatt hours, but in this case, then primary energy, not electrical, but primary energy. And so that means that uh, one kilogram of uh, hydrogen 
would then be uh, 0.033 megawatt hours, okay? And that also makes it easier than for interpreting the, um, the cost. When they talk about $1 per kilogram, well, that's $30 per megawatt hour. And you all know what the wholesale price is for electricity in megawatt hours, so then you can relate to that, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, if you put this hydrogen in a hydrogen turbine, okay, uh, let's say uh, combined cycle gas turbine, if you ever come up with that thing with a, uh, running on hydrogen, you just multiply by two and you have the electricity price. That's basically what it is, okay? Uh, just to give you some more information here, that's hydrogen there. Uh, especially that you always have to be very careful in also talking about what kind of heating value. So the energy content are you talking about? Is it the lower heating value or the higher heating value? Now the previous table, these were all the lower heating value. Now um, I have to admit that when I was a student and I studied in, uh, in power engineering, I didn't know too much about the difference between the lower and the higher heating value. Let me just, and if I'm insulting you, then just raise your hand and say, shut up, Dazlir. Um, so the lower heating value, that's basically only relevant, well, the, all the energy content, that's the higher heating value. And that's the most representative one. The point is that if you burn the gas, like for instance, hydrogen or like a methane or like natural gas, that you have a certain amount that is as water vapor. Okay, now if you leave it as water vapor, then you get there the lower heating value. If you condense the vapor to liquid, it also gives a certain amount of energy. In that case, you have the higher heating value. It's also very interesting, for instance, if you talk about the efficiencies of electrical power plants in Europe versus the United States, it looks like the uh, efficiencies of a regular, of a gas fire plant in the United States looks always worse than the ones in Europe. The reason is that in Europe, they base them on the lower heating value. Here, you usually base them on the higher heating value. So you could actually say that the efficiency that the Europeans, they cheat a little bit. Okay, but keep that in mind. It's important also for this thing. So these are the things that I kind of just said. This is then uh, if you want to convert them from kilograms to um, megawatt hours, and also then for the prices, that's very interesting that depending uh, on uh, when you talk about the higher heating value than a dollar per kilogram, that's $25 uh, per megawatt hour primary energy. Uh, if you um, do it on the lower heating value, then it's $30, okay? Okay, now uh, let's just continue a little bit with um, some preliminaries. In this case, this is the industrial use. Well, at this moment, there's basically nothing else than worldwide industrial use. Now, this is for the whole world. That's a global thing. You see there uh, the history all the way up to the year, uh, yeah, up to today, let's say. It has been growing uh, quite substantially. And you see that, uh, well, basically all of it comes from fossil fuels. Just a minute thing that doesn't. Um, and you see there, the light blue is for refining in the petroleum sector. Okay, the dark blue thing, that's ammonia. Now, this here uh, emits quite a bit of CO2 into the air, and then the question might say, yeah, why all the excitement of hydrogen? Well, the point of course is that we will very likely still need hydrogen in the future, and even more hydrogen in the future in the industry. Okay, that's one thing. And secondly, we will probably also need then hydrogen for the electric power sector. Okay, but we want to do that in a CO2 free way. This is for your information, you're gonna get the slides, so uh, please feel free to have a look at that. The reference, by the way, is on the right-hand side. It's a report that is for free available on the website of the International Energy Agency. Uh, it's quite a good, uh, well-written report. It's quite well-balanced, uh, so it's to be recommended. But you see then the inputs on the left-hand side versus then the outputs on the right-hand side, but inputs is basically all um, fossil fuels. So where does the interest of um, hydrogen come from. It's actually a long story and I'm, going, I'm not going to tell the whole story. But at this moment, the major issue is indeed that you have fluctuating uh, electric power delivery from PV and wind generation. And you need good integration in the electricity grid and then also then flexibility. Now you all know if you want to have a certain amount of energy, electrical energy on an annual basis, 
that you will have uh, quite a substantial capacity, basically an overcapacity compared to the usual loads. So we have to increase the load in order to deal with that and uh, also then the flexibility thing. Second issue is long-term storage. Okay, um, the short-term, I think most people would say that's now basically or will be resolved by batteries, but it's the long-term that uh, might, might, might cause, maybe cause for concern. So that's then the last thing that I say, or the, the bottom thing that I say, the electricity storage, okay, I said uh, short-term, okay. The medium storage, uh, pump hydro is very popular, but of course you don't try to tell the Dutch people that because they don't have any elevation. So you need to have the geography then. And even if you do have the geography, it's not easy to get basically then these things because of environmental reasons and uh, the environmental groups. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail too much, but uh, we are finding ourselves a little bit in a situation that nothing else, nothing is allowed anymore. And then you have the long-term seasonal storage and that then might be a possibility via hydrogen through electrolysis and then feeding it back, for instance, then through then uh, fuel cells, perhaps, um, and even then maybe through synthetic methane. And I'll come to that in a minute. And that's especially a concern that uh, is in Germany. This is uh, it's, it's, it's a projection because it's 2050. It's an example um, where they basically said that in those days when they made the picture, 80% renewable. But I think they'll probably, well, certainly, be almost 100% renewable then. Um, if you have indeed then, um, yeah, at, on the right-hand side, if you have then two, three weeks, and it happens quite regularly that you don't have any sunshine and uh, hardly any wind, um, they call that a uh, cold spell, or they call it a dunkelflaute, uh, in a dunkel stands for dark, and flaute means there is almost no wind. Okay, so why don't we take then everything that is below the horizontal line there in, uh, over the whole year, and try to convert that to hydrogen and then use then the hydrogen uh, in a gas turbine, for instance, and then try to um, resolve the issue. So as I said, at this moment, it's basically used as a feedstock for energy, hydrogen, uh, but it could be, hydrogen could indeed then be a very clean fuel. First, first of all, it is, there is no, if you took a uh, look at the climate, there is no CO2 emitted at the end use, clearly. But of course, you have to be careful when you produce then your hydrogen that you don't emit then any CO2 that. So that's the, the condition. And the big advantage, and that's why indeed it was so popular at some moment for, um, for, for, for cars, for mobility, because there are no local uh, emissions. And that's then for the whole thing of, uh, for big cities, then for the uh, pollution thing. Okay. Now, around the year 2000, that's when there was basically a hype um, at that moment, they said, okay, they realized there was something then for uh, electricity storage. And then it was mainly for the hydrogen electric vehicles. It was to some extent pushed by, by, by Asia. Let's say the Japanese were very fond of that. So the idea was start with electricity, then electrolysis, hydrogen, put them in a fuel cell, and then you have electricity. Now, I have to admit that for me, one of the biggest disappointments in this whole story are the fuel cells. They were the so-called promising technology around the turn of the century, but they never really made it. Now, maybe, and that's then a bit of the irony, at this moment, it seems I'm running a little bit ahead of myself. At this moment, it's especially the electrolyzers that are being pushed very hard. And then, of course, then uh, fuel cell is just the inverse operation of, uh, of uh, let's say, of an electrolysis cell. So it might well be that then if the electrolysis cells become more successful that the fuel cells might indeed then re-enter market but that will be on a competitive basis okay okay i've already said about the so-called over generation of the vre etc and then the long-term uh, electric uh, storage thing and of course then the idea is that you cannot and that's what is europe pushing very hard i'm not sure exactly how it is in this country but i will come back to that in a minute basically europe has three big uh, let's say a big energy philosophy now. The first thing is efficiency. So try to get uh, to become more efficient in the overall energy system, the whole energy economy, wherever it's possible. Okay. Um, second thing is electrify everything that you can electrify. Do whatever you can. Okay. Because it doesn't make sense to convert it first to hydrogen and back to 
uh, electricity if you don't have to. The thermodynamics are too bad to do that. So electrify whatever you can. But there will be certain sectors, certain regions where you cannot electrify everything also in the, uh, in the industry and for mobility. And there you still need molecules. And please use the molecules where it's necessary. That's indeed then what I'm saying here at the bottom. And that's where indeed then the interesting idea of sector coupling comes in. That indeed then you have then the electricity has, the electricity sector has to some, some kind, I'm sorry for saying that, it, it, it has created a problem in the sense of, um, of, of losing control of, of, of basically um, dispatch, dispatchability. Okay, now in, a nice way to do that is to couple it with other sectors. And that's indeed then industry mobility and then hydrogen might indeed then uh, be an important thing. So, um, okay, the overall objective clearly is decarbonization. And the next thing is important, that's the third bullet here. It will be different for different countries and regions. Okay, because also they will have different uh, geographical conditions, different meteorological conditions, and also different constraints and different policies. Okay, now we assume here for this story that, uh, let's say by 2040 uh, up to 2050, basically the renewable penetration will be 70 to 100% in energy terms. Um, Okay, and the three level objective, I've already told you that. And it's then in the molecules part that, uh, that hydrogen comes in. Okay, and then the newest thing of the last 10 years, let's say, is that, uh, yeah, the massive revolution with batteries and with the electrical cars. Okay, there it's clear that hydrogen has lost the competition and that indeed, and for light duty vehicles, that, that those will very likely become electrified. Now, these are the dream uh, figures that you uh, see a little bit everywhere, whether this will come true, well, who knows? And it's clear it will be different in different countries. This means an electrical grid, natural gas grid, a hydrogen grid, even a CO2 grid, et cetera. Well, we'll see. Okay. Now, just to make things clear, this is the idea of power to gas. And this was, it's an old idea, but it was basically remarketed, if I may say, by a guy called Sterner. Michael Sterner uh, in his PhD thesis in 2011, where he basically then said, and uh, let us just start with the three blocks there, wind, solar, and other renewables. So you feed them into the electricity network, then you follow the red arrow, and then you go through electrolysis, where you produce then hydrogen and also oxygen. As a matter of fact, oxygen can be marketed, okay? Uh, and then you also add CO2 to that. If you combine those two things and you put that into a methanizer, okay, that's the so-called Sabatier reaction, then you can produce methane. Now methane is basically what is, that's basically a synonym for natural gas, or put it differently, the contents of natural gas is about 90% uh, methane. So then the advantage is, of course, you can put that methane into the natural gas grid. You don't have any problems with infrastructure, etc. You feed the yellow thing back into gas turbines, combined cycle gas turbines or whatever, or combined heat and power. There is a the great thing that you shouldn't forget, that is that you have to capture the CO2 and that you feed back and it's a closed cycle. Very nice, isn't it? It's wonderful, at least on paper it is. Now this is a little bit more uh, complete with also then not only renewables on the left-hand side, uh, but also then uh, take into account storage, etc. Yeah, the colors, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to change it, but the colors don't match, but I think you see that. Eh? Now here, the gas system on the right side is in red, etc. Now, whenever I use the word G here, power to gas, I've explained it just for methane, but some people stop at the hydrogen level and they also call that power to gas. So it may be confusing in the literature sometimes when people refer to power to gas, they just mean electrical power to hydrogen. Okay, that means that in that case, uh, what you see here the, at the top there in the middle, the gas-fired power plant, uh, GFPP, in that case, that would be then hydrogen turbines or fuel cells, okay? Now, the advantage of, and of course, then you don't have any CO2 that uh, then you um, don't play with that. Now, the advantage of using methane is what I just said, that's the natural gas infrastructure that can be used. 
The disadvantage is the lower efficiency, and that's kind of clear here. Uh, don't have to, you don't have to look at everything here, but it's pretty clear that when you start with, let's say, the electricity produced by a wind turbine, if I call that 100%, you put it all the way through and you make it back to electrical power. In that case, it's of the order of, well, roughly give and take a bit more than a third. So about 33%, a little bit more, as a matter of fact. Um, although there is some uh, new developments that uh, say if you have a combined uh, electrolysis and you feed back the heat produced in the Sabatier reaction to your electrolyzer, you can increase the efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. But okay, there's still a long way to go. Sorry, this is something in German. I took this from Stender. But there you see that the, um, that the uh, Strom zu Gas zu Strom, I think that's also understandable for non-Germans, uh, well, one third. And of course that will be translated into cost. Now that's something I learned the hard way, even I teach thermodynamics and these things, et cetera. And of course I tried to push in the students all this efficiencies, efficiency and efficiency. Well, as a matter of fact, efficiency is important, but in the end it's the cost. It's the cost that will determine whether something will come through or not. Okay, so where will the hydrogen, or when I use HDF, I mean hydrogen derived fuels because we might not stop with hydrogen. We might say ah, ammonia, why not? Or maybe even then um, what they are called um, uh, hydrogen organic uh, derived fuels. Okay, so that's then the methanols of this world, etc. Now hydrogen or these things would only be then very likely for shipping, long haul aviation and long distance trucks. And of course also for industry. And how about the electric power generation sector? Well, you will see that that's kind of different from place to place. And this, you have already seen it. And then uh, Michael Liebreich, uh, if you just Google his name and then say hydrogen ladder, then you will you'll find he has also a nice uh, PowerPoint where he basically goes through the whole thing. He also published something on, uh, on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. Um, it's actually, he justifies these things and here you see well, power system balancing, and there you see where it is. Why did we have our group here, eh? our task force? He doesn't think it's competitive. Well, it will depend from place to place. And you have to look at it. And in this country, that will mean it will be dependent on state to state. Okay, also regulations, etc., and all these things where you have a lot of sun. And because the first thing, and that's the point that I will come to, you can only use this thing for balancing as soon as you have electrolyzers. If nobody is interested in investing in electrolyzers, you have to forget it. And there needs to be a reason to do that in electrolyzers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, just to uh, say a few things worldwide. Uh, this is a very interesting report also by the IEA, net zero by 2050. It's a roadmap. It's one of these possible trajectories, but it makes you think, even if you, let's say, you don't agree with it, um, because it pushes really very hard. Um, of course, on the left-hand side, that's no surprise to you what is happening there. Um, if you look at uh, the, these are wind and power and, uh, and solar PV that indeed are going to uh, go to, uh, yeah, uh, what is it there, 25,000 uh, terawatt hours or something like that. But then there's also then the bars, the three vertical bars there, uh, 2020 is today. And then look at 2050. Uh, that's hydrogen based, so that grayish thing there on a worldwide basis, that's all there is for electricity produced by hydrogen on a worldwide scale. So because there are plenty of other things, you see it's clearly dominated according to that vision, solar PV, wind, then hydropower, other renewables, worldwide also some nuclear, and then you have a little bit of hydrogen based and then uh, some other small things. Okay, so that should put things into perspective. And it will be different from country to country as you will see in a minute. So this is uh, also something that is then what industry does. That's for Germany in this, no, it's for Europe the, uh, also with Britain still there. What you see is the industry things, um, industry consumption for hydrogen because that's gonna be the starting point to decarbonize hydrogen. Right? If you don't do that, there's no, there's no way of, of getting there. 
basically, with an engineering view, you see, well, that the demand for hydrogen is roughly the same right, up to 2050. OK? But the interesting thing is, and that's what I have there on the right-hand side below, that the, uh, what is it, pink there, that's the demand for oil refinery is clearly going down because we're going to get rid of oil. And of course, then steel is going to reconvert itself very likely by means of hydrogen. So that's indeed and a very important thing. And the current idea seems to be that industry will have to be used as a trigger to get through the hydrogen economy. If you don't start there, you won't make it. And then, of course, the question will be, of course, at this moment, it's just done by natural gas, by reforming natural gas with CO2 emissions. How do you, are you going to force it immediately to green hydrogen? Many people say, well, some people dream about that, but it's pretty sure if you want to do that, you're going to kill it immediately. So you very likely will have to do it via blue hydrogen and then try to use that thing to get your infrastructure in place and then gradually let it take it over and that the cost issue will come, regulation will play a role. In the end, we will go to green hydrogen. So it will take time, but you have to know what you do. Just a few uh, other things to show um, that, uh, uh, to put things into perspective. It's again for the global demand. So in other words, it's for the whole energy uh, sector. Sorry, it's for industrial demand, but worldwide. Okay, it's that IEA report for zero by 2050 worldwide. Okay, where well you see then on the right hand side uh, that indeed um, the demand that uh, you're going to have then energy demand, quite a bit of electrification for heavy industry. Okay, then a somewhat of electricity for uh, hydrogen. Okay, and then the imported hydrogen is also there. Okay. Now, this is also something that's done for electricity demand. Okay, the advanced economies on the left-hand side, the emerging or developing countries on the right-hand side. And there you see that indeed then uh, quite a bit in the electric power sector that a reasonable amount of the electricity that will be produced will be then used for electrolyzers. So that's the demand of electricity for electrolyzers in this case but most of it will happen in the emerging countries. Okay, so in this thing would be the starting point. Uh, and then you have the parallel expansion of infrastructure, okay, uh, where you could have pipelines, existing pipelines, or you have to repurpose them eh, to, to hydrogen, especially for embrittlement, etc. Don't forget that you also need hydrogen storages. Okay, that's for instance an issue or a problem for Italy as a matter of fact. And then you have the refrigeration and regasification facilities uh, that's for liquefied uh, hydrogen uh, you need on the ship. So somebody will have to build these things and it will be different for different regions. Now that's a very important thing. And um, some people are a little bit afraid that the European Commission or the European Union is overdoing it a little bit. Okay, unwise regulation may delay or kill the hydrogen future. So you have to be very, very careful that you don't run the head of yourself. Uh, it's my conviction, but I may be wrong, of course, that we very likely will have to start with blue hydrogen. By the way, don't forget that in Europe, we have pretty stiff penalty for um, CO2 at this moment. I'll translate it in dollars. We have of the order of about $90 per ton of CO2 emitted, which is, woo, yeah, it's substantial. So that's indeed, and at the time, when these, uh, when indeed it might be competitive to just install carbon capture. Okay, um, all right. And then indeed then green, um, green hydrogen will gradually enter the market and uh, competition will do its work. Now, 10 more minutes, okay. Now very interesting thing, and that's also something that I would like to say is that you have to be very careful when you read reports and especially when you look at reports from where do they come from? Now that's the building of the infrastructure. Now there was an interesting exercise. On the left-hand side, these are a whole bunch of gas transmission system operators. And they made, together with a consulting company, the, they tried to come up with the hydrogen backbone, okay? On the right-hand side, you have a report from Agora Energiewende. That's, a, let's say, it's a think tank in Germany, which is very much 
let's say, renewables focused, okay? But they don't agree. Okay, and that's an understatement, I would say. Okay, now it's also, please, this is before February 24, and you will see then why that is. Now, the way that they did this, this is they looked at the current gas grid, and then they tried to change it. And this is then for hydrogen infrastructure. That's in 2030, and that would be 2035. Now, I'm repeating now the 2035 on the left-hand side. Okay, that's now the same thing. And then they went to 24. So that's gradual buildup. That was only 11 transmission system operators. Then they got an agreement and other things. Uh, 23 transmission system operators basically covering all of Europe, uh, a whole bunch also of Eastern Europe. And that's indeed and what they then finally came up with. Okay, well, the total length would be 40,000 kilometers. It's uh, what is that? Uh, something like uh, 27,000 miles or something like that, right? Uh, this is the cost that they say for this thing, uh, 0.1 to 0.2 per kilogram of hydrogen. Now, uh, and that they say they compare that with the, the desired future um, uh, production cost of one to two kilograms. So they say it's only a, a factor of 10. That's what they say, okay? Um, now, please recall, if you want to convert it, uh, that that's the easy way. Now, however, they also have the idea of importing massively from Ukraine and even from Russia. I would say, after uh, well, knowing what we know today, forget it. So you have to repurpose this whole thing. Um, okay, so this simply won't happen. But also then, these guys, they said from uh, Agora, said, don't overdo it. Don't be too optimistic. Look at those places where the most of the hydrogen is used, and that's what they identified. These are indeed and the chemical sectors, mostly. I would say the Houston here in the United States, that would be the equivalent. Okay, and they said, well, there are basically four places where you should start with your hydrogen, and just do that to start with, and don't overdo it. Okay, because this is the priority. You have to electrify as much as you can, and molecules only where they're needed. I'm going to skip this. You can have a look at that if you want to. But for Germany, uh, look, they, uh, they will have to use quite a bit of hydrogen for electricity generation. And the reason is because they have put so many constraints on their system that they don't have any way out. Uh, but most of the hydrogen, and that's what you see there, would be imported because they realize they don't have the means with renewables to produce this thing. So they hope that indeed there can be a, a worldwide market uh, and that the hydrogen will be produced in places with a lot of sun, a lot of wind, and that it then might be shipped to, um, to um, uh, come on, to Germany. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but this is, for instance, this is, this is a report of these uh, transmission system operators. That's where they compare then the cost of pipelines and uh, liquid gas, uh, liquid, well, liquid hydrogen, in, in several ways. That's what they do, okay, uh, with some examples. Uh, they even compare them with uh, electricity generation. I would say, take a careful look at that because I'm not sure that I believe that, what they're doing there. But the interesting thing is if you look at this report that I also mentioned before, these guys come up with at least a factor of two higher than what these optimists actually said. So it all depends on the hypotheses and the conditions. So be careful. And I can't repeat it more, but you know that it's not only for hydrogen. If they don't tell you what the assumptions are, you can't prove everything. Or say differently with that, well, people say numbers don't lie. Uh-huh, yeah. If you don't tell them what the numbers mean, then you can cheat a lot, okay? Um, this is something that you all are familiar with. I don't have much time to go into uh, this thing, but uh, let me just say the three most important things to get the production cost of hydrogen down. And that's, uh, first of all, that's what you see on the right-hand side figure, that's the capex. So how much do, does it cost for your, um, for your electrolyzers? It's pretty clear that that is a massive uh, impact. The second thing, and that's then shown in both figures, that's the, the full load hours, okay? In order to earn back your, your capex, let's say. And here you see that it's only competitive as of, let's say, well, two, three, four thousand hours a year, which will be not trivial. And then 
And also that's on the um, left-hand side, that's the, uh, sorry, the right-hand side, sorry, I'm wrong. The left-hand side basically uh, looks at certain things for the capex, for a fixed electricity input price. The right-hand side gives you, for a fixed uh, capex, gives you how dependent it is on the electricity price. And you see that the electricity price is indeed and very, very, very important, okay? And that's in detail what's going to determine that. Now, the efficiency of the whole thing also plays a role and the discount rate, and they're all uh, set there. Okay, yeah, I am running ahead of myself. This is uh, are a little bit the ideas of the future. Take a look at that. So especially the load range there in the middle, that's something that I will just mention in a few minutes. Uh, okay. Right, now the uh, thing is very clear. I don't have time to go into detail. But there are these dreams saying, okay, whenever there is then so much electricity, uh, renewable electricity generated that the wholesale price is being pushed downward, then we can feed it with zero electri uh, electricity price. Forget it. As soon as you couple it to the hydrogen sector, you're increasing your demand, so the wholesale price is reinstated. And that's, of course, then what, of course, then renewables investors, what they want to have because they want to have they want to earn a certain amount of money by producing their electricity. So that's what is explained here. You can read this thing in uh, a um, an, uh, Danish report uh, that, uh, well, let me just immediately go to this thing here. Um, it's basically pushing in many, many renewables into the system. The bottom on the right hand side, the bottom figure is what the price would be, uh, the electricity price. So it's the, um, it's this function of, of uh, uh, it is basically the price duration curve. Okay, um, that you see if you couple it with the hydrogen sector, uh, the electricity price is reinstated. If you use, and this is the right hand side figure, if you use other means, for instance, and more uh, transmission, uh, uh, more batteries, um, whatever, it doesn't help you as much as that the uh, hydrogen coupling does. Okay, then, uh, yeah, then for grid support, we probably will come back to that in a minute. What I am actually saying here, don't forget that you have lithium hydrogen, uh, lithium uh, ion batteries that are competing these days. So uh, that's a stiff competitor. And then of course, if you look at these things, you also have to look at four configurations. Uh, you have your, um, your uh, um, electrolyzer. Is your electrolyzer hooked up to the grid or not? Okay. And then your hydrogen, is that hooked up to a hydrogen grid or not? So it gives you different philosophies, different architectures and different conclusions, okay? Now, this is what I uh, pointed out to a little bit before, and that's then for the load range. Here you see a very interesting thing, the PEM electrolyzers, they can go from zero to 160, okay, uh, the load range, which means that they can feed both ways. They can basically decrease and they can indeed an over, so they can, feed in electric, electric power, basically, and they can also uh, withdraw electric power by just doing this thing. If they operate that nominal power, okay, and then they can decrease or increase, that's indeed an interesting thing. Startup times, of course, of the PEMs are uh, very good for these things. Now, this is something that, uh, it's, it's an example that uh, uh, is developed by the group by Pierluigi and Mancarella, but he's on the line, uh, so he might explain that a little bit later. So. That's where they looked at the hydrogen side and then also the electric power side. But don't forget, if you really have to push very hard, you may have to use, and that's for Germany the case, you may have to use for these um, meteorological conditions, you may have to also install hydrogen gas turbines. Now, as soon as you have hydrogen gas turbines in your system, okay, they also might then use, uh, be used for balancing. So it's again then another competitor that you're going to have in these things. Okay, and these are new uh, bi-directional operations for electrolyzer and fuel cells that indeed then in that's the right hand side there that are new publications that I have listed there the publication, the reference that indeed then a little bit like uh, an air conditioner and a heat pump eh? because an air conditioner and a heat pump is basically the same thing but they're running in the uh, uh, reversely. In this case, you might have the same thing. You use the same, uh, the same cell, okay, to, um, uh, to consume electricity and to produce electricity. So there is a lot of research going on. My conclusions and takeaway, 
Um, so it depends on the decarbonization constraints. Let me be a little bit provocative. If this country still says that they love to use or continue to use fossil fuels in 2050, there will be no hydrogen economy here in this country. Okay. Now, if you put indeed in a constraint, you say you want to go to zero emissions by 2050, then there's likely that indeed it will be there. It will be very dependent on region to region for different reasons, especially meteorological conditions. So how cheaply can you produce renewables? That's basically what it is. Um, regulation, uh, policies, uh, etc. I am personally convinced that we will have to start with blue hydrogen, develop then the infrastructure, and then in the end go to uh, green hydrogen. And we should make use of trade opportunities and uh, hope for export import. Although, ladies and gentlemen, I should say, as of February 24th, geopolitics has really re-entered the game. Some of these European studies, they say, and I don't want to insult anybody, import massive amounts from Eastern Europe or from Northern Africa. You remember Northern Africa, the Arabic spring or Arabic winter and these things? Same thing with electric power lines. Uh, 15 years ago, I would have said, I don't want Gaddafi to cut the lines, but you know what I mean, okay? And you may have good neighbors today, but they may not be your good neighbors 30, 40 years from now. I hate to say that, but we have a bad example in Europe now at this moment. Anyway, um, what is that here? The last thing that said, um, yeah, I, I do think that, uh, yeah, so grid support only if the electrolyzers or hydrogen gas turbines, if they're present. If they're not present there, you're not gonna use hydrogen for balancing. And I think there will, well, there will be no investment in hydrogen technologies only for grid support. Maybe only in a few things like Australia in certain special architectures, but not worldwide. The golden rule, and I think I can stick to that. You don't have to agree with everything I said, and I invite you to uh, challenge me, please. That are gonna give um, viewpoints in, in different kind of, from diff different viewpoints in different areas. Uh, based on their own expertise. So before we get into individual speakers, I just want to introduce the three panelists at, at the start. So our, our first speaker is going to be Brittany Westlake, who's a senior technical leader at EPRI. Um, so um, very glad to have Brittany join. She's been doing a lot of our work around uh, R&D and demonstration projects related to hydrogen production from electrolysis on, on EPRI's low carbon resources team. Uh, she's working to understand electrolysis technology performance and technical economic considerations for adoption pathways and deployment on the grid. She previously worked on with Energy's Energy Storage and Distributed Generation Program to understand battery storage, hydrogen, and fuel distribution uh, technology performance characteristics and the role they play in a variety of applications. Um, then we're going to have Pierre Luigi uh, Mancarella from uh, University of Melbourne. He's a chair professor of electrical power systems and he's also a professor of smart energy systems at the University of Manchester. I uh, appreciate Pierre Louis joining very early in the morning there. Um, his research interests include techno-economic modeling of integrated multi-energy systems, technical commercial integration of renewables and DER, security, reliability and resilience and energy infrastructure planning under uncertainty. And then we'll have Elizabeth Endler from Shell, who's a, the principal technology advisor and senior principal science expert um, in electrification, integration, and storage at Shell. She's focused on foundational science, innovative technologies, and commercial opportunities related to electrification. Um, she's a chemical engineer by training. She's 18 years experience in industrial R&D, including fundamental research, product development, and technology commercialization. Uh, she's based in Houston and uh, holds a BS from University of South Carolina and PhD from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so with that, I think each of the speakers are going to be able to share their own slides. Uh, and um, I'm going to give about maybe about 15 minutes for each speaker, and then we can have a panel discussion at the end. So Brittany, do you want to take it away? There we go. Um, thank you. And yeah, as Ada mentioned, I work at the, I work at EPRI in the Low Carbon Resources Initiative. Um, and it's interesting to note that similar to Europe's kind of focus on efficiency and electrification, 
you know, here in the US, we don't have the large, now I would say federal mandates driving decarbonization, but we did have state level, utility level. We had a lot of kind of bottoms up decarbonization efforts. And so in every, um, you know, got our pencils out, sharpened them and looked at, you know, what do we have to get us to decarbonization? And we came up with three that were slightly different than the European take, but they were efficiency, cleaner electricity, so lots large scale deployment of renewables and then electrification. And we found that those three could get us to about 80% of decarbonization in the energy sector, but that we had a gap for that last low carb, the last 20% for those hard to decarbonize sectors, some of those heat applications, the hard to electrify shipping, transportation industries, um, the steel. Um, and so the, we developed um, with the Gas Technology Institute, the Low Carbon Resources Initiative, um, where we look across, let me show you this, don't have, we look across this whole low carbon energy pathway to understand these economy-wide, carbon technology or low carbon technologies to understand how they might fit in the grid. Um, and so I have colleagues, we look at these low carbon pathways in three ways. One is electrolyzers. So hydrogen production from water with electricity from renewables. Also the pink, green or pink or yellow um, uh, hydrogen from nuclear. Uh, but I have colleagues that are looking at it from natural gas, with CCS, as well as ammonia production, renewable uh, production, pyrolysis. Um, and we also have colleagues that are looking at the storage delivery and then the different end use applications. So buildings, transportation, as well as power generation to understand how it could play a role um, you know, in an energy future. And really this is looking at when we get to 2050, here in the US, if, if we've deployed large scale renewables, how do we think about the other technology solutions that we're gonna to need to balance out the energy grid? And how do we understand their capabilities, their performance, and deploy those against other technologies to really be able to solve the energy future that we're going to need? Um, and again, we don't have the large scale you know, federal policies, but we are seeing you know, kind of recent carrots that were announced. Last year saw the hydrogen energy earth shot this goal of a dollar per kilogram in one decade, um, and then also some federal funding to help drive us towards this goal. $8 billion for hydrogen energy hubs to really drive some of that regional development here in the US towards getting regional locations to look at the opportunities between hydrogen production or low carbon hydrogen production, um, because we do have hydrogen production today, but it's made from SMR. But you know, low carbon hydrogen production, whatever the color, just reducing the carbon intensity, um, as well as a billion dollars for electrolyzer technology development and half a billion dollars to look at the supply chain material recovery. Because not only is it a sustainable way to do it, it's also economically sustainable because it helps to secure the manufacturing infrastructure, the critical materials that help you build that. Um, you know, kind of economically as well as security sustainable energy supply that you're going to need going forward. Um, and really just to highlight, um, you know, kind of today's hydrogen production is steam methane reform formation. But again, I focus on water electrolysis. So the bottom aspect of it of how do we understand these system technologies where you're producing hydrogen and electricity and that oxygen or where you're producing hydrogen from the water and electricity. Um, and having come from the energy storage space, you know, one thing to highlight is lithium ion batteries are definitely, they've, pr prices have come down with the manufacturing scale up of electric vehicles. They're making moves in this space, but the holy grail of energy storage is still finding, you know, something that can compete long-term with pump storage hydro. Something very low cost that stores energy. And I think, you know, the lure of long-term for hydrogen and water has been the simplicity of just storing that energy in those chemical bonds. Even my uh, energy storage colleagues like to say, we haven't had storage on the grid. 
But as a chemist, I would argue we have storage on the grid. We've stored it in the coal bonds, in the natural gas bonds, in the nucleus of the nuclear atoms. And as we look to a future where we're shifting from you know, that on-demand fuel generation to intermittent renewables, we have to shift our thinking and look at how do we add that flexibility in terms of chemical bond storage somewhere else on the grid um, or change, you know, how we're operating load, right? We've got to rethink, you know, the markets, the planning, a lot of the things. And so, you know, I joined William in his skepticism on where this makes sense. I think we all need to get our pencils out, take a realistic look at this. And we certainly need to make sure all of our reports have our inputs and assumptions behind any of the numbers. Um, I'm a big stickler for that as well. Um, but we need to look at it and make sure that we're doing the best apples to apples comparisons of the technologies that we have because we're going to need new solutions in the future. Um, and here in the US, we're certainly not making as big of a splash with new electrolysis demonstrations that they are in Europe and in Asia. Um, but we are excitedly watching these new project announcements. And if anyone is not graphing the IA numbers that come out, on the left, you see, this is just um, announced an online project sizing from October, 2020. And there was a question earlier on, you know, kind of the decentralized aspects of electrolyzers versus centralized. And one thing to flag that in here is, you know, electrolyzers are commercial products today. What we've seen is where you can self-generate hydrogen, where you might use it in as an additive for your water treatment process, say at a nuclear plant or in your turbine cooling. Oftentimes, they have an electrolyzer on site. They're producing the hydrogen, avoiding those distribution costs of having that hydrogen delivered. And they have that operating at a very small scale today. Where we're seeing really interesting things happen uh, in the near term, you can see demonstrated on the left side, that little notch there in the middle of the graph shows you where the peak of the bar on the 2020 timeframe with the new project announcements, where European market demand, Asian market demand are showing all these new announced projects of these larger scale systems being announced. Um, and in some cases, uh, the newest largest project was went online earlier this year. It's now 150 megawatts. Um, I excitedly look forward to the largest project system to get knocked off its pedestal um, repeatedly in short time frames as those systems get larger and larger. Um, but this is 12 months. You know, look at the change in these graphs. If you're like me and you had finished a report and just decided to check these numbers before you sent it to pubs and then had to redo all your graphs and, and change a lot of your text to reflect these new changes. Um, you know, you can be both excited and a little disgruntled at the major changes, but it's amazing what's happening. Here in the US, we're not seeing some of these project effects, but we're excitedly watching the world. And I think this also highlights kind of the two phase look we're taking at hydrogen. Today, these systems are operating in base load operation. Um, where they can find, um, I can certainly slow down, apologies. I get excited and talk fast. Um, so today we're seeing projects like this, where hydrogen can operate um, and take advantage of low price renewables in Northern Australia, in the Middle East, um, take those low, those low prices, operate at base load, and export the hydrogen. Um, but we're also looking at a future where you have more intermittent renewables and you might need more flexibility. William pointed out the reaction capabilities of PEM. And so I'll talk later about some of the research we're looking at and you know, what's the flexibility capabilities of some of these electrolyzer technologies. Um, but I'll also, so you heard from William, kind of a European focused. Next, you'll hear about Australia. Um, and while Elizabeth is here in the US with me, her case studies are gonna be focused on Europe. Um, so quickly, you know, going back to our example with the US, we, as we look to the future of decarbonization, we're seeing, seeing a changing generation mix. Here's today's generation load from the visual capitalist. You have your coal, the nuclear, 
is predominantly located here with um, the population centers. You know, and we talked about earlier, new transmission lines, new pipelines, the challenges those face. I think you know, those are gonna be challenging, siting new transmission lines, siting pipelines, moving the energy that's created from new renewables in space and time, it's gonna be difficult. And so I think the infrastructure that it's gonna to take to support decarbonization, we should not discount. But it's certainly important to then look at where are these resources? You know, your solar resources are in this top middle picture, your wind resources and the biomass resources. Definitely have lots um, here in the US, but they're not terribly close to our population load centers. Um, so I think hydrogen provides the opportunity to capture those renewables, provide some of the long duration storage that we'll need on the grid, provide the flexibility that you need with intermittent resources, and then also you know, provide a solution as you're thinking about matching those resources in time and space um, to get them to whether it's you know, shipping energy resources, thermal energy resources for industrial manufacturing applications, or potentially, and I, and I think I would argue with some of um, Michael Liebrich's um, kind of assignments, I'm not sure if heating applications with batteries is always gonna win out, but I think his take on you know stacking them up and looking at the price competitive technologies is I would argue that's the way to go. And you know ultimately we've got to look at our energy resources as commodities and match those economics. Um, but remember too, you know, we saw last year with Texas, reliability is also important. You know, I think the energy grid is a system. And so we've got to make sure that that system is there. You know, it's, it's meeting the needs it's there. And I think electrolyzers can provide that power grid services. I think the challenge is anticipating where those renewables will be, understanding how the systems can perform, and then thinking about how they might fit on the, the grid after coming from the um, battery markets, it's, it's kind of a fun exercise of how do we think about the duck curve for the future of this and where can electrolyzers plug into that? How can they perform? Um, and this is a graph I'll borrow from Cliff Ho from SNL. He created it for fitting in our chemical storage form. You know, everyone, it's easy to think about electrical storage. You make it, you move it on transmission lines, you can store it in batteries, you can use it. Thermal energy, you know, similar make, move, store, use, and then chemical energy. You know, you can make it, you can store it, you can move it, you can use it. Um, but I like the way it, this graphic shows the sector coupling of storing, you know, the electric energy. You can store it in the chemical bonds. You can even store the thermal energy um, if you think about some of the potential for the solid oxide or the high temperature electrolyzers of coupling it with thermal generation sources as well as electric generation sources and turning that into chemical storage. Um, and then having those chemical storage bonds as an opportunity for either recreating electrical energy or also for some of those thermal energy applications that are harder to electrify. Um, but I think going back to the analogy of the um, Swiss Army knife, I think sometimes the opportunity and the challenge of hydrogen is it can do so many things, but then how do you capture the, the best first application, right? I think the modeling becomes so difficult um, because there are so many opportunities. It's, when you have a hundred um, applications, which ones do you go after first? Um, and so now I'll shift to the technologies, you know, really yeah, thinking Brittany, about- If you, if you uh -huh. could wrap up in the next three or four minutes, it'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Um, so yeah, thinking about these technologies and how they fit on the grid, the two main commercial technologies are alkaline and proton exchange membrane. And the thing to think about with these is really these technologies are named after their um, kind of the membrane separator. And these are, um, it's really an anode and a cathode and the chemistry happens across the cell and um, really just, kind of holding it up in a specialized sandwich where you can put electricity across the cell to 
separate the hydrogen, the oxygen. And this is a good depiction of even the footprint considerations. Alkaline on the left is shown in the bottom and a 2.25 megawatt alkaline stack is about the size of a school bus. And so that is just the cell stack. And you have all the other balance of plant components. Um, you know, the water purification that goes into the stack, the compressors for the hydrogen that comes out, the electronics, all the other things that gives you a sense of the scale of the technology. Over on the right side is the proton exchange membrane. It's a newer technology. Um, and by newer, alkaline is about 100 years old. PEM technologies were developed in the 70s, for, 60s or 70s for the space program. It's a 1.25 megawatt stack um, with the gentleman standing next to it. And this is the more flexible, um, you know, maybe better able to grid follow, follow renewables. Um, in the future, you might think of a hybrid system where your alkaline is kind of your bigger base load, square load system, and PEM is your kind of speedier lithium ion um, load following fast response. Um, and it's a, it's a solar polymer, similar um, cell membrane. The major electrolysis types, if you're looking at the most commercially, the next one is a solid oxide electrolyzer. And that's similar to say a balloon fuel cell. Um, and Bloom is actually taking their fuel cell, making some modifications um, to turn it into electrolyzer. And so it'll be interesting in that case to see how they do some of the uh, modifications for operation, handle some of the integration challenges, um, prove out you know, performance to see if we can see some of those efficiency gains. But you know, if those work, they'll be able to capitalize on the manufacturing and supply chain that they've already built up for their fuel cell. So we'll put them ahead of some of the development curves in that case. Um, and then farther in development is an AEM electrolysis. So that's an anion exchange membrane that is you know, trying to couple some of the advantages of both the alkaline and the PEM without the challenges, um, but it's earlier in development. And that's kind of demonstrated here if you wanna look at where they are across the development curve. Alkaline's farther and more commercial. That's what you're hearing in the large press announcements um, for some of these big projects in Saudi Arabia. Um, PEM is for some of these more flexible projects, but also you know, commercial. These two are just working on scaling those systems in size, going from one to 10 megawatt systems up to you know, gigawatts in some cases, 100 megawatts. And then the solid oxide is proving out commercial products and AEM is proving out um, the technology except for NAFTA is working on a commercial product. Um, and this is just a very simplified, you know, I've talked about kind of the stack system and that rolls up into this kind of core electrolyzer product, but it's really more complicated than that. You've got to think about the whole input BOP where you're handling the electricity, the water inputs, the thermal inputs, if it's a high temperature one, as well as the output BOP. You have the hydrogen that's produced, it has to be compressed and stored. Oxygen, in most cases, you're just off-gassing the oxygen, unless you can find um, an economic case to use that oxygen, which you know, there's, I've heard of cases with Norwegian fisheries where they can use it to re-oxygenate the water. Um, so definitely site-specific site for economic cases on that. Um, you also have other byproducts, heat, um, brine, if you, depending on your water source. And so other byproducts you have to consider on these. And then of course the other, you know, this is just making the hydrogen. There's all the other moving, storing, using hydrogen considerations that you'd have to look at. Um, and so in my program, we're looking at these on number of scales. Now, how do we think about electrolyzers growing in scale? What are the supply chain, manufacturing, you know, operational considerations of these growing bigger? How long-term do we think about these from a flexible operational perspective? How do we think about their potential on the grid? How do they perform? Um, we're doing performance testing. We have a project set up with NREL so that those performance um, uh, results will be public uh, once they're available. Um, and then we're also looking at, you know, how does that fit into the bigger grid? Working with projects, uh, working with groups like Aiden at Every, 
and other groups, even our power quality, um, the water groups, and understanding how electrolyzers fit like other grid assets and thinking about their role in the larger um, part of the grid system, especially as as they look at, you know, there being more of them as distributed assets or as they get much bigger as central, centralized assets. Um, so really working on how do they perform? What do they cost for their lifetimes? And how do we think about that in the context of decision-making from portfolio planning, the economic fit, project design, procurement, their operation, and then of course, end of life to meet low carbon goals. And that. I will hand it off, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. So we'll um, move, move to uh, Pierre Luigi next to, um, to cover some of the experiences in, in Australia and some of the modeling he's been doing. Pierre Luigi, are you able to share your screen? Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I should be able to see it hopefully. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I just say it's, it's a great pleasure to be, well, to be to be there somehow, even just virtually. Uh, and yeah, as uh, I, I'm just going to give you like a few minutes, a little bit of an overview of the, some of the recent work we've done uh, in Australia, also motivated uh, from actually the huge interest there is on uh, um, green hydrogen here in Australia, including for uh, export purposes. And uh, uh, the, the focus of the, of the work uh, that I'm showing is really about uh, uh, frequency control and serial services that potential electrolyzers could provide. So somehow uh, on, on top of the kind of slower balancing that uh, may be uh, possible or be coming from electrolyzers, what, what are the abilities to basically provide the fast frequency response and even like different types of services that we show you a little bit like what we already see in Australia that large scale batteries are, are doing. In fact, just to give you a little bit of uh, context, uh, it's we, we, we know now for many years and we're seeing uh, practically in Australia and other uh, places around the world uh, that uh, in low carbon grids dominated by renewables, we have uh, frequency control issues, particularly because of, uh, we, of, of system inertia um, uh, going down, fewer, fewer synchronous generators be in the system. And with system inertia going down effectively, uh, it means that uh, the frequency uh, dynamics uh, overall uh, is much faster. So if uh, the, the normal frequency dynamic following, for example, a contingency event loss of a generator would be the blue uh, trace here, effectively with uh, a, uh, with lower and lower inertia, so fewer synchronous generators, you start having a, a frequency going down normally much faster, so higher rate of change of frequency and much lower in the And eventually this could lead to, to, um, to, to, to issues like in, including a frequency uh, instability and collapse, uh, like we saw, for example, in the case of uh, the blackout in South Australia in 2016, there was effectively a problem of, of frequency collapse of this, of this kind. Uh, there are other issues, uh, including aspects of uh, uh, frequency resilience. So it's like there is now an extreme uh, event and uh, very quickly the system can cascade uh, uh, into, again, a frequency uh, collapse. And we have seen a couple of issues here, uh, again, uh, in, in, not only in Australia, but also in, uh, uh, in Great Britain uh, recently. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, also because in, in, during a frequency collapse, you start having lots of frequency dependent interactions with protection schemes, for example, of embedded generators, uh, like, like it happened in, uh, in, in Great Britain. Uh, and again, something to, to, to deal with. And finally, in general, there is a requirement for more regulation service uh, because renewables uh, like call for more and more uh, need for fast uh, balancing of, of the system. So in this kind of context, uh, we know that batteries can do uh, great things. So we've seen this uh, in, in Australia with a number of large scale batteries. What is that uh, electrolyzers could do uh, in this context of low carbon, low inertia? I would also add uh, low system strength uh, um, grid. Although, uh, you know, in the focus of this work uh, here is really about to try to understand uh, the fast uh, active active power services, the frequency control and services from electrolyzer, I would like to, to say that the work that we've done so far also shows that there is a potential in 
um, weak networks for electrolyzer actually to contribute to more general system stability, so voltage stability uh, and other types of stability that we, we witness uh, in, uh, in, in weak networks um, in that. But again, let's focus on frequency control and serial services, not fast uh, the active power dynamics. So how do we model the electrolyzer capability to uh, provide this kind of services? What can we expect from electrolyzers, particularly in uh, the uh, with, with respect to what batteries could do, and eventually if we look at uh, the whole system uh, going again low carbon, low inertia, like we've already seen uh, again in Australia, uh, what are the benefits and challenges that electrolyzers could provide? Again, to be put in a context that electrolyzers may be there anyway to produce hydrogen, so we're not installing here electrolyzers to provide uh, these services, but once we have electrolyzers, because we need them for, for example, green hydrogen production for different purposes, as the other speakers are, are showing, certainly um, William was showing uh, earlier, unfortunately I could not attend uh, the, the William's presentation, but I saw, I saw his slides. So once you have them, uh, why not to use them to provide all these kind of services? Uh, the modeling that uh, we've, done, we've done so far somehow, and also coming from, um, from literature really, and from real world, uh, uh, experiments on top of which we also added some sort of electrical engineering um, thinking is pretty much based uh, on this kind of approach. So there is uh, uh, effectively a uh, kind of there is a hydrogen production module, you know, that really interacts with the electrolysis stack. Then there is a power electronic interface, and of course there is the interaction with the external grid. External grid, uh, there, there may be different types of applications where you would put uh, an electrolyzer to so large scale, a transmission level scale electrolyzers could be microgrids and distribution grids. Uh, of course, it could be uh, like some kind of hydrogen, uh, renewables hydrogen hubs uh, uh, that would have a, a DC, DC link. Then depending on the kind of application where you put electrolyzers, you would also have different types of power electronics interface, then back-to-back -back converters typically in, in, in like transmission level, um, utility scale electrolyzer transmission level connections or DCAC and DC, DC converters, depending where you are, for example, in microgrids or again, kind of behind the meter, uh, renewable, uh, renewable hub uh, um, applications. Then when you look at, uh, of course, the technology, again, I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert, no, there are, there are different types of, of technologies and we try to model this from the perspective of the, of the dynamics of the electricity system. Uh, and then of course, again, you can have different types of application, large scale, uh, like many megawatts can be like a plant of uh, um, different types of electrolyzer following different architectures in the way that you built the, uh, the, the plant in different sizes or small scale or down to basically you know, a kilowatt, tens of kilowatts uh, and all that. And finally, of course, when we, again, we go, we talk about the, the hydrogen process, uh, there, there are lots of different types of uh, applications there from chemical industry to just production of hydrogen for, for export uh, and, and all that. Now, just to give you an idea of, of the modeling, I'll, I'll just go very quickly here because I think the details, you know, yeah, I invite you to have a look at the papers, but just to give you an idea about uh, thinking, there are basically different types, the three modeling components effectively, the electricity stack, the power electronics interfaces, and downstream process and buffer for hydrogen. And then when you look at the stack in particular, there is a, a model of the electrical circuit representation vector the stack, then the production model, and then a thermal model somehow that takes into account what happens in the temperature and potential temperature constraints that you might have uh, in, in the system. So this kind of uh, a, a model that is really coming from the physics in a way, we really did the kind of physical model like, like but a bottom-up model or classical of engineer approaches. So you more than stack and then a buffer and then what, what happens like downstream. And if there are constraints uh, in, in the operation system at any point, you try to, uh, to model that. Now, when it comes to the uh, power electrons interface, uh, there, there may be different uh, types of uh, interfaces and controls. For example, it can be a grid following control that would be a virtual synchronous machine control. These are all things we've already uh, uh, tested. Uh, and uh, there are, we, 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 you know, there are the papers available case. And then 
how do you provide with this kind of controls different types of uh, services, particularly frequency control and serial services. You can have contingency uh, services following an outage of a generator, particularly fast frequency response, uh, basically under one second, and uh, primary frequency response is a bit, a bit slow and you're of 10 seconds. So electrolyzer could in principle provide both depending on also the market setup. Then the weather they would provide it, there would be different approaches, can be just a droop control, uh, so following kind of frequency deviation and proportional response can be a sustained droop control where you follow the, the frequency deviation, but then you sustain the power output uh, of your uh, uh, electrolyzers or reduction in case. And then there is a, a rate of change of frequency based control where the response of the electrolyzer uh, follows the speed or the frequency drop rather than the frequency uh, itself. And then of course, it, they can also provide uh, a regulation um, uh, a, a regulation frequency uh, control. Finally, the latest developments look at the potential provision of virtual inertia, either in virtual synchronous machine control. This is particularly useful, again, if you are in low inertia conditions and you want to displace areas, uh, uh, displace synchronous generators that uh, would have been provided the service in uh, uh, naturally uh, in, uh, uh, in in system. Uh, I will uh, just go very fast uh, here because I think that otherwise we won't have time. But again, this just the idea of uh, that you know the kind of modeling that there is behind uh, uh, can can be can be complicated on the on one hand, but on the other hand, is really coming from the physics, the engineering of uh, the the modeling, uh, the physical model, the electrolyzer, and the power electronics interface and control. So we just try to put things together in a more or less smart way, I would say. And then when it comes to, for example, the, the actual provision of the service and, and the controllers again, see, you try to develop appropriate control loops that takes into account, for example, what happens in the case of the contingency events, what happens you want to have a, a, a reg regulation service. And if you are to provide a longer a kind of, a longer duration kind of frequency response, for example, secondary, um, frequency response or, or long duration power frequency response, which as it might be, for example, in Europe, then uh, you may have to interact also with some form of thermal constraints because you not know, just the system could heat up and therefore you will need to basically uh, start introducing uh, cooling and, and fan power that of course it would then reduce, for example, the power level uh, or that, that is available from your electrolyzer. So again, all, all, all kind of physics driven modeling. And then once you have the constraints from the physics, you try to understand what the actual capability of, of the electrolyzer in providing these different services um, would, uh, would be. Just to give you some example now, let's consider a fast frequency response service, basically a sub-second uh, uh, frequency response. And in this case, uh, what we did was we took a low inertia system project in 2030, Actually, we didn't need to go that far. Australia is pretty much already operating like this. And this is a kind of very simplified uh, modeling of the Australian system when you have different regions. This is South Australian grid. This is the interconnector between South Australia and the rest of the system. This is the famous interconnector that tripped uh, during the South Australia blackout when this part of the system went black. There is another interconnector here with Queensland. And here you see the largest basically contingency we have currently in the system that is uh, about 650 uh, megawatt in Queensland. So what we did uh, uh, in this kind of study, uh, we basically said, okay, what happens if you have the largest contingency in the systems? What happens to frequency dynamic in different states? So in here we we'll see the frequency dynamic in Queensland where the contingency happens in the central part of the system and then in, uh, uh, in South Australia. Now, and then no, this is like the frequency, this is the, the, uh, the, the rate of change of frequency. And as you can see, uh, at a certain point, you have a very high rate of change of frequency, basically ha ha higher than uh, one hertz per second following uh, the, the contingency uh, of the generator that is again located in Queensland. Uh, if you look at the dynamics of South Australia, as you can see here, first the frequency goes down and then the frequency goes up. The reason being that uh, when there is a very fast dynamics in um, low inertia conditions. And at a certain point, uh, if you look at the power flow 
on the interconnector, the power flow will go up actually a very, very fast way. And because of the speed of change of the power, so not the amount of power, but speed of change of power, then uh, the, the system is basically designed uh, to trip uh, on uh, rotor angle uh, instability protections. And that's, that's what happens here. The basically, there is a huge power flow following a frequency event in the north of Australia and Queensland. And this very fast uh, change of the flow uh, makes the interconnector trip. Therefore, South Australia goes and landed. And so you can see here, basically, there is no longer a, a, a power on the interconnector. And when South Australia goes and landed, it goes from a, an under frequency situation to an over frequency situation. Actually, this has already happened. This is not modeling. We basically reproduced already. I mean, it is modeling, but we reproduced what's already happened a couple of times in the uh, Australian system. Now, if you put in. Can, can you finish up in three or four minutes? Yeah, I, I will. No, thank you. Then when we put uh, an electrolyzer in the system to be able to provide fast frequency response, as you said, we tested the different control schemes like droop control, sustained droop control, and rock off based uh, uh, control to test actually the performance of electrolyzer on this case of one gigawatt, which is big for, for time being, but actually it would be small uh, in, uh, in, in the future, as, as, as we know from many, many projections and many developments, um, actually. So when you look at uh, the kind of different uh, response of electrolyzers following uh, such an event, effectively what you, what you see in different scenarios is that as we uh, would expect, uh, uh, the, the, the performance may change. And of course, you, know, you have some, some of these performing uh, some of the schemes performing better or not. And in the, in the studies that we did, there is a sustained droop control that was actually performing better. Uh, in this case, like this kind of yellowish trace was performing better in terms of trying to, to stop the frequency um, uh, drop uh, and then try to, to re, re, uh, reset the frequency back uh, to a normal frequency. However, you know, be, besides uh, this kind of specific uh, um, re response, really what matters is that uh, the ability in general, pretty much like batteries, to provide this kind of frequency uh, support to the system. Very similarly, when you look at the regulation services, kind of continuous services, what we did was we tested actually both the performance of PEM and alkaline based on the physical models that uh, we, we built. And um, effectively, when you look at uh, the kind of uh, performance, you see that they're not uh, very, very different. So when you look at, you know, this is like time in seconds, then this is the way that uh, um, the, the, the power of the two uh, electrolyzers are changing following the AGC uh, signal. And if you go a little bit more in detail, you see that effectively we are talking about difference in performance between the PM and the alkaline uh, in the order of a few percent uh, uh, when, when you look at the, the total uh, power that needs to be modulated following the uh, AGC signal. So relatively good performance also of the slower alkaline systems compared to PEM. And what we did here, we also uh, compared the, the, um, what, what the battery, uh, what, what the battery would do. And then you see here the battery, you see here the PEM and the alkaline, and pretty much the performance are, are quite uh, aligned. And then we also modeled the potential virtual inertia response from um, electrolyzer. Again, it's uh, low inertia conditions when you will need most. And what we did here, and if you focus on the what, what happens in South Australia area of the system, you have no electrolyzers. What happens to the frequency? In this case, it's an over frequency event. Then you have a grid following electrolyzer, this green one, and then you have a virtual synchronous machine uh, electrolyzer. Uh, and you see basically that the frequency performance uh, improved a lot with a virtual synchronous machine. But what is most noticeable also is that the rate of change of frequency is actually much lower with, uh, um, with, with effective virtual inertia being provided by electrolyzers and be able to basically like, like reduce significantly the rate of change of frequency, so the very fast response of uh, uh, the system. And again, what we've done here, we actually, sorry, we actually compare the response of the electrolyzers and uh, the response of the uh, batteries um, with the virtual synchronous machine control. This, this virtual synchronous machine control is taken from real batteries 
uh, in, in Australia. And again, you see that basically electrolyzers, PEM electrolyzer in this case was like 150 megawatt PEM electrolyzer uh, plant was actually, it, it is able to pretty much perform the same way as, as, as a battery once it is probably equipped with control mechanisms and all that. Uh, so the, the, to, to, to sort of conclude, I mean, the idea is that there are lots of system services that can be provided. And of course, you know, this technical system services can also correspond to market services. And there is lots of work that has been done uh, in Australia, including from, from my team, try to understand how you turn the physics into the economics. Uh, effectively, there is a huge, uh, uh, huge potential. So to really conclude, like this is come, somehow the model I showed comes from unified dynamic model framework we try to build for electrolyzer of different types of with different uh, uh, control schemes. They seem to be able to provide, and say seem to be able, we're already seeing this in many applications and we try to generalize this to also future applications such as virtual inertial response. They seem to provide excellent uh, capabilities to provide uh, system services. Alkaline, even if considered slower, they can actually provide good services, including very effectively um, regulation services. And overall, the perfor their performance, particularly for PEM electrolyzers, are very, very close to uh, batteries. So we should we will have to see what will happen in, in the future once we have lots of electrolyzers. Do we also need, for example, batteries to provide this kind of services? With the battery, with the market opportunities becoming more and more mature, I guess we need to look into potential challenges. Of course, no, there will be less services will be limited by the converted uh, capacity and also by constraints on the hydrogen side that we modeled. And somehow this again require a better understanding of intersector, cross-sector planning. It's kind of multi-energy system view of uh, of the future. And uh, that's it. Uh, that's that's a very fast overview of, of some of these kind of opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Pierluigi. Um, so we'll move to um, Elizabeth then, and uh, we'll have questions again for Pierluigi at the at the end. So Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you able to share your screen? Is it up now? Yep. Perfect. Thanks so much for having me here today. Um, this will be, as Aidan mentioned in the introduction, an in, basically an introduction to a number of different case studies where we as an industrial user and producer of hydrogen at Shell are thinking about and deploying these various technologies. I will be focusing predominantly on where hydrogen can play in industrial decarbonization rather than say transport and other things, but I will make a few mentions um, in terms of some of these cross-sector applications. Um, additionally, the work that I will be talking about today uh, is representative of a number of colleagues across the organization from R&D to operations to commercial uh, finance and, and all other elements in between. So a, a big thank you to all the folks uh, who have made these projects possible and continue to move them forward because I will also be talking about work in progress. And so to build on that point, some of the things that I will be talking about are forward looking. So just wanted to uh, share this disclaimer with you and uh, direct you to www.shell.com for deeper information uh, regarding investments. So hydrogen in the future energy system, uh, don't wanna spend too, too long on this, but did want you to see again, a little bit how we think about things and also to, sorry, also to really highlight some of the points that have already been made as a, a, in terms of where is hydrogen going? So we see four big buckets of hydrogen demand over time. This first one is really where we are looking today for a lot of the offtake of clean hydrogen. So really looking at replacement of where hydrogen's already used. Brittany mentioned several of them, William did as well. We're also looking at where is where are traditional fuels used a lot in the industrial sector for heating purposes? Where might hydrogen be very um, useful in decarbonizing those energy uses as well? As well as then more, I would say, in the built environment, potentially for heat, 
transportation, whether it's long distance travel through lots of different modes, um, showing here a car and an airplane, but really shipping and uh, long distance trucking are also very much in the mix. And then coming back to where does this fit in the power sector? We have talked about long duration storage. We've talked about essentially clean fuels in terms of being able to provide that reliable dispatchable generation in the overall electricity mix, whether that's from hydrogen directly, whether hydrogen's used potentially as a feedstock for synthetic natural gas or complementing um, other forms of decarbonized gases. All of these have potential opportunities as we look at a future energy system. And in addition, we've talked about how hydrogen can really, through electrolysis, help uh, provide services as both a load as well as delivering potentially later on in this value stack uh, in the merit order, providing that electricity back. So again, really going to focus on industry because we see a lot of opportunity in the near term. A lot of times hydrogen is talked about as future, but this is really something that I wanted to talk about more as how are we approaching it today, moving toward the future. So philosophically, um, one of the big ways that we work through this space is to say, OK, we're going to start at a particular location expand within a nearby area to talk about what we would call a hub, then moving a little bit further afield into a cluster, and then more into a what we would call a mature tradable type of a market. And so when we talk about that in, in step four, that's really getting much closer to what we would typically think about today with the natural gas networks, be they pipeline, be they liquefied natural gas, but really, when you think about that fully de developed commodity type of market for hydrogen, that the analogy would be what we see today for natural gas. So to walk through this in a little bit more detail, if we talk about this own use piece, um, I'll be talking about both of these proof point projects as we move on. But it really is a single point project that allows us to use the produced hydrogen in our own operations. The second piece is going a little bit beyond the fence line. And so you start to see these blue dots in different places. And so that's where we're able to produce more than maybe we would want to use in our own operations, as well as then looking to help decarbonize a broader interconnected area, but still relatively localized. Moving a little bit further, this gets back to what it says interregional and starting to move a bit more international. We are starting with Northwest Europe for a couple of reasons, and I'll, I'll get into that on the next slide in a little more detail uh, in terms of what some of those drivers are. And finally, with step four, this really starts to look at how do you move this as much more of a broader um, ener energy carrier within the larger energy ecosystem. So to talk about locations and also to highlight a little bit, um, we've talked mostly about green, pink slash yellow uh, types of hydrogen relative to say blue hydrogen, but I really did want to just take a moment to explain that we are looking at both blue and green, and this is for a number of points. Um, one of the projects that we have in the UK, project name is Acorn, the reason that one is a blue hydrogen project is that location wise sits at the confluence of both North Sea natural gas production today, as well as locations for CO2 storage in the North Sea. So um, the reason for that one being blue, you're able to pull that natural gas in, produce hydrogen that um, has a much reduced carbon footprint. You're able to store that uh, CO2 in uh, appropriate reservoirs, just very uh, near offshore, and then use that hydrogen to decarbonize both the natural gas network to a certain extent uh, at low percentages, as well as decarbonize industrial efforts that are nearby in that uh, near that terminal where all that gas processing takes place. So wanted to highlight that. And I will also talk a little bit about one of the blue hydrogen projects uh, in the Netherlands as well. The rest that um, I'll speak about are green and different types of electrolysis. So HVision really gets at how do we decarbonize the port of Rotterdam? Um, as um, 
folks who are familiar with uh, goods, shipping, and movement, the Port of Rotterdam is one of the largest global ports. Lots of traffic, lots of energy to run the port as well as run the maritime enterprises um, that are moving goods in and out of that port. And so with this particular project, again, the focus is around looking at using decarbonized hydrogen and really using blue hydrogen produced from refinery fuel off gases as a primary feedstock rather than pipeline natural gas and really moving toward doing this very, very soon. So, and it says here, well before 2030, even um, as the current timeline is more on the order of say 2024. And so really about getting this hydrogen, this clean hydrogen to scale very quickly in terms of really laying the foundation for the infrastructure that you need within that port environment. Moving into green, but still in, within the Netherlands, one of the examples here with our Rotterdam electrolyzer is um, really focused on how do we pair electrolysis with offshore wind in this particular case. So what you can see here is um, in, this, in this one, these numbers correspond to kind of the locations here that we're talking about. You've got this uh, block with an offshore wind farm in the North Sea cooling in, coming on shore, driving that electricity to a 200 megawatt electrolyzer looking to be on stream sometime next year. Really using that, then taking that hydrogen and moving it toward our refinery, where again, you would look to displace hydrogen that's already produced today from natural gas, so really decarbonizing that supply. But as this potential uh, project can expand as both the electricity offshore opportunity expands within that uh, within those um, different blocks that are being built out uh, currently being auctioned off by the Dutch government as more of those renewable electrons become available the opportunity to expand that then can start to look at how do we use this for a broader network in this particular case potentially for long distance heavy duty trucking. This one is actually rec was recently announced as a 200 megawatt alkaline ele electrolyzer. And that's in contrast to the work that we're doing now in Germany uh, with the Refine Consortium at our Rhineland refinery, where this is really focused on demonstrating and growing uh, the PEM technology. So really, at the time, back to Brittany's point, um, when this slide was made, it was the largest of its kind. That was, I believe, about eight months ago. It's probably been surpassed at this point, but it's still one of the larger PEM, uh, PEM style electrolyzers that is uh, coming into operation. And so with this one, again, initial displacement of hydrogen from natural gas used in refinery operations with the potential to scale into that 100 megawatt type of regime. Staying in Hamburg, but also looking at now, not just looking at industrial siting and industrial offtake, but what can we do within the current energy system? So this particular hydrogen hub is actually based at a retired coal plant, based the power plant Moorburg that you see here. And one of the key elements here is being able to bring in electricity at scale, power electronics and um, uh, high voltage and things are in place because of the power generation capacity of the previous asset. And so now looking to be able to take advantage of that siting location, bring in renewable electricity, use electrolysis to produce hydrogen for the local offtake in the area, whether it's again, ports, whether it's potentially for electricity as we need baseload, whether it's really for, again, continuing industrial use and growing that decarbonization of ongoing hydrogen consumption in the, in the area, as well as this one has the dimensions of the local heat network as well. So we've talked about, uh, Brittany mentioned how certain te uh, technologies really lend themselves toward high temperatures and where some of that can be heat integrated to different systems. This is an example of where that element would is also under consideration to really show that larger energy system integration. Finally, in terms of how moving to the future, Nord H2 is really a very large scale project and you can see a number of uh, different participants, including the gas network in the Netherlands, Haas Unie, 
Um, really looking at very large scale now gigawatt types of scale from again off sea offshore North Sea wind farms, bringing that into that power uh, onshore, doing the conversions to hydrogen, and then being able to either send it to industry, send it to storage for a variety of uses, being able to use it as a buffer, um, being able to potentially repurpose gas pipelines for again easy transport. Really starting to get at what are all of these challenges that we have that were mentioned around moving energy in time and space? But again, this is still very much uh, fairly fairly short distances, onshore wires, pipes, that sort of thing. Finally, just to wrap up, I had mentioned some of the analogies to moving energy today with natural gas versus pipeline, but also as LNG. We also have work to pilot, test, and develop how could you potentially use hydrogen in a more global type of energy system, in this case through shipping? And so just wanted to highlight here some work that we are involved with actively to demonstrate the potential for liquid hydrogen shipping to support, again, the ability to move energy in time and space between regions of the world that are, say, more resource rich in this case, from a renewable, whether it's solar or wind perspective, moving that to more energy constrained locations, again, analogously to LNG. We do this demonstration because hyd hydrogen is not natural gas. And so there are a lot of technical considerations to, to deal with and um, uh, manage. And so that's part of the reason that this is the uh, initial demonstration of this type of technology. That's all I really wanted to highlight and happy to uh, answer questions and look forward to the discussion.